Howdy folks! Have you ever thought what it would be like if dragons were real? Well, for starters, you might have to worry a little bit more when you went out for a walk in the country. Kind of look up in the sky and make sure nothing's swooping down on you. But seriously, if they were real, and they had always been real throughout history, things might be a little bit different. Steampunk Desperado channel for part two of Here Be Dragons. In my previous video, I did a rather exhaustive survey of dragons in myth, folklore, and modern fiction. Over the years, I've read dozens of books concerning dragons. My latest obsession, though, is with the temporary books by Naomi Novik. This is a nine-book series set during the Napoleonic Wars in the early 1800s. I actually first saw the author maybe, maybe about ten years ago at the Phoenix Comic Con. And she was on a panel, and she was, of course, touting her own book. Uh, Dragons in the Napoleonic Wars, she said, is the, was the premise. And it sounded intriguing, so I looked it up. And especially because it sounded kind of steampunkish. And uh, I enjoyed the first one, but eventually I was hooked and ended up doing them all. And I'm now on the ninth and final one. The name Chammerer is the name of the primary, primary dragon protagonist. Uh, he is a Chinese celestial, and his human companion is Captain William Lawrence of the British Royal Air Corps. He was originally a Royal Navy ship captain, and his ship captured this French ship uh, because they're at war, and they found the ship was carrying a dragon egg. It was a gift from the Chinese Emperor to Napoleon. Of course, they confiscate the egg, and while it's on board, Lawrence's ship the egg hatches, and like the dragons of Pern, the egg, the dragon that is, bonds on the, onto the first person it sees after hatching. That person happens to be Captain Lawrence, <laughs> and this completely upends his life, and because they don't intend it, it's, it's completely accidental. They're trying to, to bring up a proper aviator to be bonded, somebody who was trained to be a dragon rider, and Lawrence was not. And this dragon immediately bonds on him, so there's no choice. He has to quit the Navy and become an air, airman, which is tough because he's a lot older. Typically, they train them from being little boys, basically. They train them, they ride on other people's dragons, they become good at it, and uh, they lose their fear of heights and so on, and learn to be around dragons. And Lawrence has to take it up as, you know, as a grown adult. I believe he's in his 30s or something. And he's kind of an outsider to the Air Corps, and at first they have a hard time accepting him because there's this rivalry between them and the Navy. As you'd expect, as anybody who's ever been in the military knows, there's always, there's always these rivalries. Now, as in the Pern series, the dragons are so attached to their humans that they have to basically live close together. Because the English people are very scared of dragons and their, you know, fierce possibilities, they live away in these kind of isolated areas called coverts, which don't have a lot of the benefits of civilizations. They're kind of, they're kind of, um, kind of primitive, and the aviators have a very well, kind of uh, bohemian type, <laughs> type lax lifestyle compared to other military people. And they're they're kind of outcasts in British society, and because because of their dragons primarily. Now the young dragon, Temeraire is very unusual because he's a the cele Chinese celestial, which is the most prized type of dragon. He's very powerful and he grows to be very large. And as such, Lawrence, the newcomer, has a great deal of authority now within the Air Corps because of the prim primacy of his own dragon. And he and the dragon end up at fast friends, as close as can be, and they get to travel all around the world as part of the Napoleonic Wars and efforts to, you know, bring other countries in on Britain's side. So they see all these different countries. They go to China, they go to Africa, the Ottoman Empire, to Australia, to South America, and, of course, to Russia during Napoleon's ill-fated invasion in 1812. As in many dragon-related books, the dragons in 
the Temeraire series can think, talk, and fly. Like humans, they have unique personalities. Some are good and some are evil. Most have unique forms of defense, including fire breathing, although that's actually kind of rare. Some can spit acid. Some are just big and strong and can like squash their enemies. Uh, others are, are, uh, are small and swift and can fly away. And others have very fearsome claws and teeth. Some can see in the dark. And, and thus can evade their enemies. Chinese celestials, such as Temeraire, have the divine wind, which is a roar that can knock over buildings and uh, break rocks and, and fell trees. And the, the dragons, although they're intelligent, and some are very smart, including Temeraire, he, he, he loves calculus. He, he's always wanting to read Principia Mathematica. And which is something that Lawrence finds difficult to understand. But he's also very childlike. As in most dragons, he's kind of a single-minded personality. You know, they, they, they want treasure. They love to battle. Like dog breeds, they vary greatly in size, but they can interbreed. And they sometimes produce bizarre hybrids. Such as uh, when Tim Rare ends up mating with a fire breather. Uh, later in the books. That's a bit of a spoiler. Probably shouldn't have said that. The presence of dragons has a interesting and very strong effect on human society. Different nations deal with dragons in different ways. Some nations, such as the English, fear them but use them anyway as a form of defense. The Americans, of course, use them for, for commerce and making money. The Russians exploit them a rather terrible way. The Chinese revere them, and some African tribes actually believe that dragons are inhabited by the spirits of their ancestors. Dragons become, in this world, this alternate world, they become a major factor in warfare. They're used by pretty much all nations as a form of aerial warfare, well before the airplane was invented in our real world. And, of course, they can do bombing runs, they can they can use their fire breathing or whatever. They can have riders firing guns at the enemies. There's all sorts of possibilities. The crews vary in size. You can have one man riding a small dragon, which are often couriers, or dozens of men on a giant dragon like Temeraire, who's supposed to weigh like 20 tons. And yet he can still get up in the air and fly with numerous men on his back. And that's partly because dragons supposedly have these air sacs that can help buoy them up in the air. And that's one of the explanations that makes it kind of more science fiction-y than, than fantasy-like. Their effects in human society also include altering the balance of power. Uh, because it's kind of a great equalizer. China is a great power that does not get dismembered like it did in real life because of its love of dragons and the vast number it has. It's, it's a very strong military asset. The Incan Empire survives despite the Spanish invasion because the dragons defend it. Even though so many of its people die from smallpox, it's like the dragons outnumber the people almost, and, and they're very possessive of the people that they have left and almost treat them like their own property. The Africans, they can use the dragons to fight back against the slavers. Now, a lot of them do get enslaved, but eventually they figure out how they can fly across the sea and fight back. In England, they have a number of interesting effects as well. There's a breed called the Long Wing that bonds only with women, and thus the Royal Air Corps is required to accept female aviators, despite the fact that the, they totally disapprove of this. And in fact, they keep it secret from the public. Most people do not know that they have female aviators. They dress as men and try to disguise themselves. And they have this unique culture because they don't tend to, they don't tend to marry because it's such a kind of a vagabond lifestyle that women in the Air Corps, they will tend to have children out of wedlock. And, and uh, happily so, because they want to have daughters to take their place. Dragons outlive humans, generally. So they need a daughter to take their place as captain when they are gone. 
And uh, Lawrence finds this very shocking at first. He's just appalled. Eventually, of course, he meets a nice uh, uh, female captain whom he develops a relationship with, and he keeps wanting her to marry him, and she keeps refusing him. <laughs> uh, but in any case, they have they have part of this culture. These girls that that are born to these female aviators, they tend to be raised in the core as dragon riders from day one. Another thing is that because dragon riders are so valuable, they pretty much tolerate gays in the air service. Of course, they have to, you know, keep it keep it on the down low. Of course, but uh, Lawrence is in fact shocked to find out that one of his fellow fellow aviators is, has a relationship with a man, and and uh, and they refer to him by the old timey term invert, which I had not encountered before. What do I love about this series? Well, first of all, there's the very British dialogue and, and sensibilities. You know, they're very, uh, Lawrence has a very proper attitude to every, everything and his sense of honor. They have interesting phrases like saying, showing away instead of showing off. And they'll say stuff in place of crap or other rude words. Occasionally they will swear, but very rarely because they're very proper. Uh, it incorporates draconic legends from around the world, including the Australian bunny. I had to look this up when I when I first encountered it, because I'd never heard of it. Now, some of them are a bit of a stretch. For example, the Incan dragons are much like Quetzalcoatl. They have feathers, and they're very showy, and so on. I suppose uh, Novik thought it was cooler than the llama head dragons, and that you know people would want to see a Quetzal-type dragon, but on the other hand, the Aztecs weren't very sympathetic. <laughs> we didn't really want their culture to survive because they sacrificed people. So, so it kind of made sense the way she did it. I love the engaging characters in this series, particularly the stodgy Lawrence, who develops, becomes more open-minded as the series goes on. But he's very honorable, and his sense of honor gets him into trouble. Chemerere, who starts as a very childlike and impulsive and impetuous, becomes more mature and uh, can has a sense of control that a lot of dragons don't have. And he's able to to uh, motivate other dragons to you know, respect military discipline to a degree. <laughs> uh, the, the brilliance of this dragon is just amazing. He, like all dragons, he it can talk, but he's especially good at mastering human languages. And he, French and English, of course, uh, but also Chinese because of his Chinese Chinese ancestry. And the fabulous narration of Simon Vance. I've done all the audiobooks in this in this series. Probably partially I, I sometimes will read the actual book or do an ebook, but he is so good, especially as as Lawrence and Temeraire, that I you just can't help but love it for that reason, all the different character voices he does. The book has a clear message, obviously some modern viewpoints like slavery is bad, but they don't really hit you over the head with it too much. Lawrence disapproves of slavery, his father's an abolitionist, but you know he has to get along with people who agree with it. And it's multicultural in the sense that they pick up aviators from different countries, but it's just because they happen to go there and not because England is some sort of multinational paradise back in the 1800s. <laughs> uh, it is Available on audiobook, not only on Audible, but at my public online library here in Phoenix, which is astonishing. Most of the steampunk stuff that I listen to is not available. Only super popular books, so I was very happy that I didn't have to buy them all. <laughs> Finally, Tim Rare was nominated for the Hugo Award for Best Series in 2017. Didn't win, but it should have. It would make a fantastic movie series. Because modern CGI, the way they did the dragons, for example, in Game of Thrones, you could easily do it in here. And people would love Tamrare. I'm sure Novik was thinking, I could sell all this merchandise. I could have a little toy Tamrare and a little toy uh, Eskirka, who is the fire breather, and so on. And uh, I could just see those toys being like the big thing next Christmas. Who knows? Thanks for watching part two of my series, Here Be Dragons, which focused this time on Naomi Novik's nine volume series Temeraire. Hope you liked it. Let me know what you think about it in the comments below. Please like and subscribe so we can continue to get out the good steampunk word. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, 
Adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.